Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Uh, Welcome to another episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. This week, my guest is Nolan Sandburn. Nolan, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. First, Glenn, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on here. I got I to gotta plug my own thing real quick. I have a podcast myself. It's called The Ball Player Mindset, and oh. it just talks about we break down uh, not just the professional game, but talking ourselves about what uh, separates the amateur from the professional. So I don't really do it that much anymore, but it's still one of those things that uh, if, you're, if you're an athlete, it's something to consider uh, listening to. But um, once again, Glenn, thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun to uh, discuss property and investing because that's kind of turned into my um, hobby and my passion now is um, not just becoming a successful investor myself, but also bringing along everybody else. I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, the, the, the tide raises all ships, that kind of thing. So um, I really enjoy it. I'm, I'm excited to be on here. I think there's a lot of education and, and things that, uh, especially when it comes to tax deeds and things of that nature can be, uh, if you don't understand the laws and the rules, um, it can you know put you at a disadvantage. But if you are one of those people that pay attention, you study, and you understand it, you can, it can make you very, very wealthy, uh, uh, very significantly quickly too. I love that. Um, I I do I have done some research on uh, the tax deeds because I have been very interested in this. So yeah. if I get like if we kind of if you can try and stop me or even stop yourself when we're talking to try and simplify it for people who don't know anything about tax sure. deeds because I'm really bad for like skipping over if I say some terms and stuff. <laughs> so like try and let's try and make it so people who know nothing about tax deeds and tax liens can like yeah. can understand this and then they can contact you and they can find some stellar deals. So of course let's start off like square one right to start uh okay. let's talk about tax deeds tax liens in alabama what are they and how are they different okay so one thing that makes alabama different than pretty much every single other uh state in the union really is how they go about property taxes and when someone is delinquent so yeah. one thing that separates them is that every year very similar to other states they all have tax sales yeah. so you know you have Let's just say, for example, a thousand investor, a thousand properties that are on the courthouse steps that are being sold. Well, if 800 properties are sold, what happens to the other two? I mean, 200. A municipality has to pay its bills one way or another. They have to pay the mayor. They got to pay the firefighters, the schools, all that jazz. Yeah. So the way that they do that is the state of Alabama steps in and purchases these properties uh, from that particular county. Now, the state actually is the one that owns those property. They're the ones that now put a lien on that piece of property. It's just considered a tax certificate. So for the first three years, when that property is sold to the state, it is known as a tax certificate. After it has been owned by the state, quote unquote owned by the state for three years, it then matures into a tax deed. And that can be a big thing because that allows investors to know that, Hey, if this thing is about to mature into a deed, then any particular person that has owned that property in the past is losing, will lose that administrative redemption right to go in and pay to, to basically buy back the property, whatever the back taxes plus interest on top. So before that, for the first three years, it's a tax lien. And then at the three years, it's a tax deed. It's still considered a lien, even at, even though it's a tax deed. But the difference is that the person for the first three years, the, the deed holder, yep. whoever has lived in the property before, they're allowed to just go down to the courthouse and say, hey, how much do I owe on this thing? What are the back taxes? Yep. And they say, you know, $5,000 plus interest. So then they just essentially go to the person that purchased the certificate and they say, hey, what do I owe you? And that's basically what it is. However long they've owed it, it's 1% per month or 12% a year annually of accruing interest. So... Once you decide that once that, like I said, after those three years of that property being a certificate and matures into a deed, that owner has now lost their right to go in and just go to the courthouse and just say, hey, I'd like to redeem this property. They've lost that right. Let's let's repeat that again, just so I'm double double extra clear on that. So at the three year mark, they have no they cannot come back anymore. But if you can you buy it before the three year mark? Right. You could. Right. 
Yeah, you can absolutely buy it. Once that once that property turns into that certificate, it's purchased by the state. Yeah. You can then dive right in there and purchase that thing. And you there's actually some a lot of uh institutional investors that will go in and buy these things and their only ambition is to get the 12% a year return. And then after when it comes up to close to three years of being a deed, they really don't want to deal with the property management. They don't want to deal with the tenants. So they go and sell that piece of property to another investor who their goal is to cash flow it. The, yep. You know, these big, huge institutions, they just want the 12% so they can give their investors that. So there's a lot of different strategies that you can go about this, you know, throughout the entire process. Interesting. And one thing I, I, I just looking at my notes I made, and one thing I yeah. totally kind of off topic is how some of these even become uh, tax deeds is that the property had no will in place. So like the person, some people have died and in Alabama, it's a little bit different as I understand, you can correct me, is that uh, the property, if there's no will in place, will go to the state. Uh, so if there's no will in place, it goes to the kids, the wife first, and then the kids. And if none of those exist, then it goes to the state. And then it can become a, a, a tax deed after that period of time. Am I right there? Or am... Yeah, it's got to be probated uh, correctly. And sometimes whenever there's a piece of property that's not probated accurately, let's say, you know, the, the, the kicker is a lot of these, let's say, for example, a parent has happens to die and they will it to their son or daughter. Well, what eventually happens is that because there wasn't ever a mortgage on that piece of property before, where most mortgage companies will wrap up the property taxes, the insurance and the principal and interest all into one payment. Yeah. Well, when a prop, when a person doesn't have a, you know, a mortgage on it and they're just paying the property taxes themselves, that son gets the property or the daughter gets the property. And then they realize like, Hey, you know, I just got a, a sweet piece of property and they don't realize that there is actually taxes that you got to still pay on it. So most of the time you'll, you'll just find it's a deceased person's house that the son or daughter either lives out of state or doesn't have the money to redeem the property. And that gives you that opportunity to go in and, and get it at a sweet discount in a good area of town. Okay, cool. And then, so, um, so you buy this property, say you bought it at like year one. Um, yeah. you rehab it, you throw some tenants in, uh, and then the person comes back and wants their property back. They want to pay their tax deeds. What happens there? This is one of the best parts about, uh, Alabama tax property. So like I said earlier, the person, if they want to come back and redeem from you, they have to, they have to pay the back taxes plus interest. So if you, if you purchased it on the first day that it was available and it's gone for six months as a certificate and this person wants to come back and says, Hey, I'd like to buy, I'd like to redeem my property. Yep. Well, they owe you the back taxes plus 6% of interest. Yep. Okay. But if you happen to put on a new roof, maybe you change the locks some new windows, things like that. It's not the cost of the new roof and the locks and the doors, it's the value. So for oh. example, if you were to hire some, uh, some, some cheap labor, like your, your younger brother or somebody, your cousin or whoever it is, to put on a roof that let's say cost them 2,500 bucks, but you have you know, uh, AIG or some, or Allstate, some company come out and quote that, that roof at 10 grand, well then now that person actually has to go out there and pay you back $10,000 plus interest on top of that as well. So you can price that 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 person to come back and redeem it out like fairly quickly. So to to prove that you have to go get quotes for full price beforehand is that the best way to do it just so you don't get uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just get some if you get a couple and it's really easy too because if you have like a realtor or a contractor and they just shoot you a quote and you just take before pictures and then after pictures um Obviously, the county courthouse is going to look those, you know, that up, and they're going to understand that. Hey, this is just this is the price of you know doing mm -hmm. real estate. This is the price of doing a deal, right? Okay. So a lot of these, like what we're talking about now, we've always assumed that we're going to have vacant possession. What if uh, the, what if somebody lives in there? What if it's the owner, or yeah. what if it's a a tenant? What's what's the yeah? So there's another thing, like I said earlier, once you receive the certificate from the state, there's two different scenarios here. When you have the certificate, I'll explain both of them. Yep. When you have a certificate, it's different than when you have a deed, but you get to demand possession immediately once you get the certificate in the deed. So what I mean is demanding possession is changing the locks or, uh, like I said, putting a new roof on it, showing that, hey, I'm in control of this piece of property. Yeah. But like you said, if there's someone that's living in that property, you can't just go and 
change the locks on someone that's living there. Yeah. So what you do is you essentially just send them a certified letter of mail that says, Hey, by the way, I purchased this piece of property. And, uh, you know, now you, now your time tick, now your time clock is ticking. Um, one more thing I need to mention too, is whenever you purchase a certificate, whenever there's a price notice sent from the state saying, here's the back taxes, that person is also getting a letter from the state saying, Hey dude, someone's trying to buy your house. You need to pay the back taxes. So they're very aware that, you know, their property is delinquent. It's not, it's not a, just a crazy shocker to them. It's everyone's aware of what's going on. Yeah. So, but what happens is that person's going to get that, receive that certified letter in the mail and they're going to either, you know, look at it and completely discard it, or they're going to pay the back taxes and then you get your money back with interest. Yeah. But that's going to start the, t the time talk, which is 180 days or six months of time before you can file for ejectment. And ejectment is different from an eviction. Eviction is if it's your tenant and you're evicting that person. An ejectment is when you're ejecting someone that is currently occupying a piece of property that you possess. So when that person goes and, and you file for ejectment down at the courthouse, you're essentially uh, writing a lawsuit against that person saying, hey, you need to get out of my house. This is mine. So after those six months comes up, that ejectment has been filed. It, it takes about another four weeks for the judge to, to get to your case. And uh, then he files the ejectment. And then the sheriff goes out to the house with you. And, you know, the guy's got 24 hours to move all his stuff out. Okay, so um, – so say yeah. say you, you you got this property the 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 guy whose back taxes who actually owns the property is still in there you have to keep him there did I understand that wrong for 180 days? He you don't have to keep him there he just that's your your ejectment filement so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get him out of the property I just I just have to send him a certified letter and let him know that hey I now own this property you either have to pay these taxes back or yeah. You got it, or you have these six months to basically get out of the house because then I'm going to file for ejectment and then I'm going to force you out of the house. So you can either get out on your own free will or you can be forced out by, you know, the sheriff. So I guess, like, worst case scenario, you might have uh, a, an unpaying tenant for six months if you bought this, right? Worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. That's completely accurate. Yeah. Okay. What I've experienced in the past, especially especially what I've done is I try and go after, and here, here's the second part of this yeah. is I try and go after um, properties that are beginning to mature into deeds within like less than six months, because once it hits that deed status, boom, you can go in there and file for ejectment the same day. So then you don't have to wait for the six months. You can just do it. Like I said, the same day. And that forces that person out even quicker. So there's two kind of two, two kind of different strategies on that. The certificates, if you're going like, you know, let's say that they just got sold to the state, you're basically playing the 12% a year game. But mm -hmm. if you're going after those deeds, you're going for, hey, I'm trying to buy this thing and I'm trying to stick a tenant in there in cash flow or I'm trying to flip it and, and, and sell it to another investor. Okay. And so for me, like say this was like you're like, oh, I don't want to be messed up in all these laws. Is there uh, – you don't have to give names, but like – Sure. Would you recommend like a, an attorney uh, that specializes in something like this or um, sort yeah. of something like that? Yeah. yeah. I actually will give the name too because he is, he, his name is Greg Stanley. He's an attorney here in Birmingham who um, he actually teaches a class and his, his name and information is actually on my website. Okay. And he, uh, he teaches a class basically just introduction to tax and investing in the state of Alabama. And he's a tax professional. He's a tax expert. He knows the ins and outs of the law. He, he obviously converses with other attorneys about tax law uh, daily. So um, he's one of the guys that I've trusted with my property. I know multiple investors that also trust him whenever it comes to doing quick claim deeds or warranty deeds or uh, transfer of title and ownership. He's, he's the guy in town to go to. That, that, that's a, probably a great contact to yeah. have. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, say I buy this property uh, and I renovate it and, you know, I like to do the buy and hold, but say I want to flip it. Is there uh, a period that I have to keep this property for before I should flip it to keep a nice clean title? No, you don't. Here's, here's, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret and what I've uh, actually really have done that's been successful for me mm -hmm. is what I'll do is if I buy a certificate here, I know that my play is once I can get the certificate in hand, I'm going to go make it really difficult for that person to redeem it. And if they do, I know I'm going to at least make my money back, most likely double it because I put a new roof on it and it's going to cost them, 
you know, 2,500 bucks, they're going to have to pay me back $14,000, we know, including yep. the property taxes. So what I do is if I'm going after these certificates, I will, like I said, I'll price that person out really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and then after I fix the property up and I, you know, I get it kind of how I want, I'll figure out the total cost and the value of them. And I'll just go to the person who actually owns the house. I'll try and track them down. I'll figure out who it is. And I'll say, Hey man, you know, look, you got three options on this thing right now. You know, one option is you can pay me, you know, the amount of money in which of the value of this property that I have in it. And I'll just give the property back to you. No problemo. Yeah. Option number two is you can do nothing. You don't have to pay me. You can just sit there. I'm going to eject you since it's, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, since it's vacant, the ejectment process takes way quicker, it takes about four weeks. So it's a lot quicker. And then, or option number three is I can pay you right now 200 bucks to quit claim the deed over to me. And of course in their head, they're going to look and think, ah, oh, well, I guess that makes the most sense. I didn't have 200 bucks yesterday. I wouldn't do anything with this house before. Sounds good. I'll quit claim it over to you. Now you have a quick claim deed, which creates a marketable title for that property. So you can go and sell it at retail price because you can get title insurance. Wow. There, so, that, yeah, is, so all, that is, that's it. That's what I was missing. That's the, the I've talked to like three different people selling tax deeds and they were always like, you need, there's a three day, three year redemption period. Don't flip anything for three years. You have the main, minimum. You have to hold this. You can't do flips with this. And there is the, there's the golden nugget right there. That's it. That's the, that's the golden nugget. Getting that quick claim deed expedites that three year process of having acquired the title. It just allows you to boom, get in there and you can find a title company that will, that will give you title insurance in no time. Awesome. Okay. What else do I need to know about, the, these tax deeds is there is there anything else i missed here well one thing that i would suggest i mean you're right on it these are these are b the, the basics you know i'm not going to go into any legal things oh, yeah. because okay. obviously i'm not a professional no. but what i would suggest too is that if you're going to flip a property or you're going to rehab it like i said you know you go in there and try and price that former person out Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have the certificate or that deed in hand because let's say that because it takes – if you've ever been to the DMV, you know, there's 25 people online. There's two people working. Yep. So that's the same way it is at the state. You know? So when you go and send your money into the state, it's going to take them two to three weeks for you to get your certificate or deed. So just because you send your money in doesn't mean you can automatically go and, re and, and rehab that property. Wait until you – because like I said earlier, when you put that money in, that former owner also gets a letter from the state. So maybe they were surprised and said, oh man, I, you know, I, hadn't, I forgot to pay that or whatever it is. Make sure that you wait until you get the certificate or deed in your hand because then if you're having to rehab and you put $10,000 into that house and they decide to say, hey, actually I am going to go rehab that property, then you're just out 10000 bucks because you didn't ever have, I mean, that chain of title was never broken from the previous owner in the first place. Wow. Yeah, that, that, yeah. You know, we don't want that. I know what we should have started with off the very start, which to get people yeah. excited is what is an example of a tax deal? What kind of numbers? What uh, what's the after yeah. repair value compared to these tax deal prices? Let's we missed the biggest, yeah. biggest, the biggest, most exciting the number part. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me explain one thing about the about the reality is there's not going to be a whole lot of property that is delinquent in nicer areas of town. It's just a, it's just a matter of fact, you're not going to get, I mean, you may stumble upon a piece of land that's in a good area. Uh, somebody that died, but rarely will you ever get a really nice piece of property that's delinquent in tax just because these people have the money to always pay. So what I've experienced is I always, and every investor is different, but I'm always playing for the cash flow game. I'm not really going, appreciation is always a, a cookie on the back end, as you know, mm -hmm. but I'm always playing for the cash flow game because I know that that's the only thing that's king right now is cash flow. So when I look at a property, I don't care if it's on the West side. I don't care if it's on, if it's in a bad part of town, all I'm doing is I'm making sure that my numbers are watertight. So what I'll do is what I've done in the past with investors is if I happen to, I, I do everything from, purchase. So what I'll do is I'll purchase a, a, a property myself. I'll flip it. I'll get the quick claim deed and I'll sell that at a premium to another investor who just wants a turnkey rental. Mm -hmm. I go and find these properties and I'll just wholesale them over to other investors. Or if someone's wanting a piece of land, you know, I, I just try and find out what investors are wanting. And, and that's kind of the way that I play it. But a typical numbers, I would say 
depending upon your preference. I, I love the Section 8 game. I know some people are a little skeptical about that. But when I've owned property on the west side of town where uh, here's another tidbit that you can use when you go in and if you are using Section 8 is I make sure that I tell these tenants before I say, look, this is not your house. This is my investment. I'm the one taking on the risk here with my money. If you mess this house up, I promise you, you will never receive another subsidy from the United States for the rest of your life. I promise you. And you kind of give them that little scared straight kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. And I got a guy over there on the west side. He still takes his shoes off when he walks in the house. That's awesome. Just because he does. And, and I mean, these people, they just don't want to lose their, 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 their free subsidy, really, if you think about it. So yeah. um, I love the Section 8 game personally because uh, they happen to rent for more than market value. I can uh, – market value on the west side in Birmingham – you know, I'm looking, you know, you're looking in the mid 600s for a three, one, three, two, maybe 750 on section eight on a three, two, I can get 900 plus all day long. So, um, my cash, I mean, if I, if I buy this thing, let's say if I, a, a wholesaler for, if I wholesale this to an investor, for example, and he buys this vacant piece of property for $12,000, he can probably put $15,000 into this thing, get it spick and span, rocking and rolling. He can, if it's a three, two, he can rent that out for nine fifty, nine seventy five every day of the week. That's and then you're in the, and another thing too, let me mention as well is that your property taxes aren't going to go up. Your, 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 the assessment is not going to get, is not going to go higher just because it's no longer vacant. The property taxes are because it's on the West side of town, you, they're not going to go up. So if you're paying annually 600 bucks a year, it's not going to bounce up to 3,200 bucks. It's going to stick around you know, 600 to $700 a year. So your cash on cash return is significantly higher just because the insurance, the property taxes just aren't as high in, in, you know, wealthier areas of town. Yep. What, since I got you on the, on here and you're talking section eight, one question I've always had is whenever I'm applying for financing in the States, they always have a checkbox asking if it's going to be section eight, uh, a tenant that's going to be section eight in the property. So is that, does that hurt my chances of getting a mortgage or why is that checkbox on the application? Are you referring to like a FHA loan or what type of financing you're referring to? I can't even remember where I was, what I was doing, but I remember fi- on one of the applications, I think I'm, I'm not, I don't use the FHA cause I'm Canadian, okay. right? So I don't have it. Oh, that's I, right, yeah. I don't have access to all that stuff. So I'm usually talking um, institutional lending. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if I actually have that. Okay. No, I just thought I'd ask since I had you. Yeah. I'm assuming though that it's, it's always just, it's just, it's, it's the same thing as sub some prime mortgages. I'm assuming, you know, yeah. you're just dealing with people that haven't made great financial decisions in their past and that can spook people, you know, that can spook any lender that where they think they're taking on a higher risk. So they want a higher return. So I can completely understand why a mortgage lender would feel spooked about that. Yep. But like I said, in my history, the way that I've, that I've worded this and made things happen, um, man, section eight happens to be a godsend. <laughs> I got one last question. Cause of um, course. compared, uh, I know with you, whenever I look through your tax deeds, it has the address and, uh, like a picture of the front, right? Yeah. Uh, when I've looked through some other people's tax deeds, they don't provide the address and they actually wanted, a deposit in order to get the address. Oh my gosh. <laughs> is, 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 is that like irregular? Like, are they just worried that someone's going to go around them and not use them once they have the address? Or like, I'm, I'm just, I was always like, why do they, why would they do that? Well, that seems a little unethical in my opinion. That seems very uh, non-transparent, which I try and run my business where I'm completely open and honest with what I do. Mm-hmm. But in my opinion, I would assume that these that this person just has the property under contract yeah. and with a you know the you know whoever is the one that's selling the property and they're afraid that they're just going to go give them the runaround and you know cuz they're marking it up you know they're yeah, marking yeah, yeah. it up 10 12,000 yeah. so I I mean I'm all about everyone getting a piece of the pie I have no problem with that everyone's got to win the deal I'm all in on that Oh yeah I, I use wholesalers too. and I have no problem paying them Yeah <laughs> especially if they're going to get your uh, get you a good deal so oh, yeah. I totally get that but uh, it, it is. It would assume to me that either they they don't have something uh, it, that just seems very unethical okay. and, and something where it just doesn't. It would. I would not feel very confident that this person can close the deal if they're just asking for you know twenty five hundred bucks up front just to get an address to a piece of property. I know because like I ideally I would 
at least like to know the neighborhood, right? Like, cause, of course, because <laughs> you know, it's just uh, you know, I have my things. I, I I don't like. I'm very comfortable with C properties or C minus properties, but I don't want a war zone. So <laughs> yeah, one thing one thing I would I would say too is it when when I have people on my buyers list. I will always, I'll provide the property ID and then I want, I want to create a dialogue with my buyers because some people will just kind of scroll through it and see if something pops out. Um, but if I can have someone that says, Hey, you know, can you tell me more information about this piece of property? Then I can open up a dialogue and say, Hey man, that sounds great. Here's the information. Here's the parcel. Here's, I, I'm all about being transparent, but I want to have that conversation with people. So then they don't happen to get a bad rap where they feel uncomfortable about a you know, buying some type of property that can, you know, essentially be redeemed. So one thing that I've done too with my buyers is I've provided a, essentially an insurance. I mean, I, I, I talked to my attorney, Greg Stanley, he created a document that's essentially a guarantee rider surety bond. It's an insurance policy where what I do is I say, look, you're going to get, you're going to put your money in this escrow account and I'm going to, and I'm going to sign this certificate over to you. I am not going to touch this money until you get the deed to the property. It matures into a deed or for one reason or another, if it gets, if it gets ejected or excuse me, not ejected, but if it happens to get redeemed, then I'm just going to wire the money back to you. So okay. that person out of the gate just feels like, you know what? I feel comfortable doing this. I have no initial downside risk. I don't feel like this guy is scamming me. I just, I want people to really be successful in this business. So I even go all the way to where I'll go down to the recorder's office at the County courthouse and I'll record the property. I'll assess it in that person's name. I really want people, I'll, I'll hold their hand throughout the whole process. So then, you know, from the very beginning of purchasing all the way to getting that first check from the property manager where you feel like, okay, I know exactly what I'm doing now. I feel honestly really comfortable doing this again and again, because it's not about, a, you know, a one trick pony, a one time show here. I'm trying to build relationships with buyers and individuals to where not like you where it's just one person out there that's doing it all. It's like, Hey, this can be a really a, a great thing for a lot of people in all over the country. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's just one thing that's worked for me. And, and I, like I said, I just love helping other people that, that are interested in this because um, if you just know the rules, you can really, really take off because it's such a tiny niche, especially just here. Obviously every County in Birmingham has property, but, or excuse me, in Alabama has property, but Birmingham, I think uh, in Jefferson County alone, which is where Birmingham is, I think there's another 16,000 properties that are coming on the books uh, in 2019. So wow. the opportunity is there. You know, it's just now it's up to us investors to go out there and turn those rocks over and find them. Awesome. Uh, did we, I don't know if we actually discussed this, but what is the typical price of one of these tax deeds? So depending upon your, your strategy here, um, what, you know, if you buy them directly from the state, depending upon how far it's been, you can buy them anywhere. If it's a piece of land, you know, a parcel of land, you can get them for, I mean, no kidding, like 600 bucks. Yeah. Um, most wholesalers will, you know, mark it up a little bit. I would say that you could probably buy one of these things for, I mean, an assessed property would be, you know, in the forties, the sixties, and you could buy it for 10 to 12,000 bucks. And yep. then the rehab is going to be anywhere from, you know, like I said, 10 to 15, sometimes 20, depending on, right. you know, what your strategy is. But yeah, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Do you get to see inside the property or is it kind of like the, um, the foreclosure auctions where you don't get to see it inside the property until you own the property? Uh, well, that's a little bit of a dicey line. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the law says you cannot go into the property, but if it's completely, you know, if it's been blown out or if there's something that's going on where there's a door open, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, I yeah. got no problem snooping <laughs> yeah. around and trying to snap some pictures. Cause if I can provide a better, you know, a, a better look of what's actually going on with this house to people, uh, or even to my contractor, I mean, yeah. then I'm like, Hey, I can show it to him and say, Hey, what do you think the rehab is going to be on this thing? then it just allows me to just have my numbers a little bit more dialed in. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Is there anything else I didn't ask is uh, to both tax deeds or we got this covered? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, 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 you got it pretty covered. You asked some really great questions. Um, if I can think of anything else, uh, like I said, my website is sandburnholdings.com and you can always, uh, we got, uh, we have the phone numbers for mortgage lenders, our property management, our contractor. And like I said earlier, our attorney, Greg Stanley, he's got his information on there. So um, there's a lot of great things um, that investors are doing. It's, it's awesome to get creative. So um, if you're, if anyone's interested to know more, 
don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm, I'm more than willing to, to walk anyone through the situation because it can be, I mean, honestly, it can be life changing for sure. Yeah. And I think even if they, if they found you through this podcast, I think that we've covered a lot of the questions. Off the start. <laughs> they, they just, just listen to it a second time and take some notes a second time. But I think, I think we covered it all, a lot of it, at least as far as I know, I covered a lot yeah. of the stuff of the, that I know. Um, Cool. And you covered, you listed your website so people can find you. Um, you know what? Thanks so much for coming on the show. Like this was, this is actually one of those episodes I was really excited about. Cause I, it's just another, like right now I'm all like excited about my wholesale deals and I'm even more excited about my foreclosure and short sale deals. And yeah. this might be the next level above the two of those where I can pick up some, some deeds at some good prices. I just yeah. need to build my team up in, uh, in Birmingham. Cause I'm, currently not operating in that city but uh it, it sounds like it it it's a good it's a good opportunity that i'm missing out on well not that you may not be missing out or not but i know like i was saying earlier i i when i when i sell a property to an investor i completely open up our team to that person we want to provide that service where that person can come in and say hey i can i use your contractor to rehab my property the answer is yes can i use your attorney to go and deed this property over to me yes yep. i mean everybody is i mean all available and they're all in to help because at the end of the day as you know i mean investing is a team sport everyone can get a chance to win this deal and birmingham is, is, a, is a great city it's up and coming um not to mention we really didn't discuss opportunity zones i'm not sure if that's another thing that you've uh heard about or learned about but just with the federal government creating those opportunity zones in lower income areas where if you happen to invest your money and you park it in an area for 10 years uh you essentially get to make all your money when you decide to sell or whatever capital gains are tax free so um not if you're buying you know like you said earlier <clears throat> these are not home run areas yeah but over the next 10 years because all you have all these investors parking their money and, and feeding money into these areas you never know what the appreciation could be on the back end and then oh. it's all tax free so you just don't know it's hard to predict that but um it, it could definitely end up being a significant appreciation value on the back end yeah enough people put it in and a neighborhood will change from what it is to something great <laughs> no doubt i mean absolutely it's been it, you can already tell i mean like like i said people are starting to, to turn and burn these things and you can really see some nice property but there's so much property out there that i just don't yeah. i just don't ever see in I, I don't ever see in the the supply go away yeah awesome okay i know that you're uh you're a busy man. I'm going to let you go. I really, honestly, really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, I I learned some more, and I'm sure there's a lot of people, anyone who is even curious about tax deeds is like their their mind has been like thoroughly saturated <laughs> here. So they're, they're, I'm yeah. sure you're going to get some calls out of this. I, I And if anyone's listening and wants to uh, ease the, the, I don't know what you call it, the uh, jitters of crossing the border even and they yeah. like the um, <laughs> they like the 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 low price of getting into this i uh let's 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 talk jv we'll uh, we'll go talk to nolan here and uh, get That's something right. done yeah no doubt i think there's like i said opportunity all over the place so please do not hesitate to reach out to me i would love to uh i'd love to just talk more details with people because once you understand it can absolutely it can be a home run i mean like i said everybody can win this deal so um, reach out to me, reach out to Glenn. Let's, let's, let's figure out how we can all, how everybody can win. Awesome. All right. Have so, a great night, Nolan. I awesome. really appreciate this. This is awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Glenn. I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you, man. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll see you later. All right, man. Bye-bye.